Okay, folks, uh, welcome to KINS 3313 Health Promotion Program Planning. Um, you know, my name is Jim Lidstone, and I'm a faculty member here at Georgia College, and I've been teaching this course now for, for quite a few years, and uh, we do it both in the regular spring semester and then in a shortened uh, version of Maymester. Um, in both of those cases, I want to try to get students involved out in the community and do something uh, meaningful. Um, you know, so so we can help our community, but we can also learn through doing. So, um, what I want to try to do this uh, semester is to post a lot of these narrated uh, PowerPoint presentations. Um, I've usually posted the presentations, but have gone over the the material in class. But what I'd like to try to do this semester is. Uh, post these presentations ahead of time with narration so that you can look at them and we can spend uh, our time in class you know planning health promotion programs and applying the materials that uh, we learn through the lessons so with that in mind uh, let's get started and uh, get into lesson one all right so lesson one deals primarily with concepts and terminology it corresponds to the first chapter in the book and so we're going to be talking about health education uh, health promotion a broader term uh, concept of health education specialists and program planning all right so uh, here are the learning objectives for the for this lesson and uh, I'd like you to take a look at those I'm not going to spend time uh, reading through them but uh, I think it's a good idea to go through the lesson and then after you've uh, done that, come back to the learning objectives and uh, determine how well you feel that you meet those. Um, so for example, for the the third one, write your own definition of health education. You know, don't just say, oh yeah, I can do that. You know, actually go ahead and do it and uh, test yourself. And, and uh, I think you'll find that it's more difficult than it sounds, and it's a good way of determining whether or not you're understanding the material is to, uh, you know, do a, do a check on uh, these learning objectives. Okay, so here's some of the terminology in the chapter, and you can use this as a way of uh, studying uh, for the quizzes that you're going to have later, but... Uh, you know, terminology like decision makers, health behavior, health education, health educator, uh, health education specialist, health promotion, the different levels of prevention, pr uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, priority population, and stakeholders. Those are all things that we want to make sure that we understand once we're finished with lesson. Okay, so uh, why do we need health education or health promotion? Here's um, a list of... Uh, of factors from a table that's on page two of the first chapter of the book. On the left hand side of the column would be the causes of death uh, in the United States that you would typically see on a death certificate for someone who's passed away. But on the right hand side are you know what the actual causes of death would be. So you know somebody may uh, succumb to heart disease but really when you look at the you know, the real causes of that, you know, most of those causes are behavioral. So people who are not taking care of themselves, too much stress in their life, um, you know, not eating right, not exercising, you know, those are the real causes of, you know, a person that passes as a result of cardiovascular disease. And so as health educators and health promoters, we want to address those, those causes as opposed to the things that we see on the death certificate. In fact, we even want to drill down deeper than than those causes and try to find out, okay, what um, you know, what are the the real causes for a person not eating properly? You know, it may be that they don't have access to healthy food in their neighborhood. They live in a so-called food desert. So, you know, those things even go deeper than just failing to consume, uh, you know, the proper kinds of food. So let's keep that in mind as we as we continue to move forward. All right, so uh, this graph shows how things have, uh, you know, really turned on their heads since the turn of the century or turn of the 19th, uh, the 20th century, I mean. So, you know, back in the 1900s and all the way through to, you know, about 1940 or so, you know, our primary concern in health education and health promotion was on infectious diseases. 
So things like uh, diphtheria, smallpox, um, you know, those kinds of things, you know, those were causing the, the major issues, uh, you know, in the, in the nation. And so gradually we've gotten those things under control through uh, vaccination programs and things like that. But what's happened is, you know, with a corresponding decrease in infectious disease, uh, what we've seen is, a, is an increase in uh, chronic disease. So things like obesity, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, you know, all of those things are on the rise and continue to be on the rise. So, you know, uh, rightly so, we've turned our attention more since, uh, you know, the 1970s or so to, uh, to chronic diseases as opposed to infectious diseases. Okay, so this, uh, you know, kind of shows, um, you know, kind of chronicles the, um, our efforts in health education. So in the late 1800s all the way through 1950, we were focusing on the infectious diseases. Then in the 1950s and 60s, we brought those infectious diseases primarily, mostly under control. And then in the 70s, we started to turn our attention more to the chronic diseases. In 1980, the first major uh, health promotion effort called Promoting Health, Preventing Disease, Objectives for the Nation was uh, developed by the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And then that morphed into the Healthy People initiatives that I know you probably heard about, uh, Healthy People 2000, 2010, and 2020. Um, we're now, of course, in, uh, in the midst of Healthy People 2020. Um, you know, what we typically find at the end of those periods is that, um, you know, in terms of the objectives, um, about 30% we make progress on, about 30% it's status quo, we haven't made any progress, and about 30% we even are going in the, in the wrong chain. So when we plan our pro health promotion efforts, it's always a good idea to link them to something like a, uh, uh, a state health initiative. Um, Live Healthy Georgia is a he health initiative for the state. Healthy People 2020, a health initiative for the nation. It helps to give your efforts credibility if you can tie those into some major uh, state or national health promotion efforts. <clears throat> All right, so let's get into some terminology. Um, in this chapter, you'll, you'll read about health, health behavior, health education, and health promotion. Uh, so let's take a, a few minutes and look at each of those. Um, a good, again, a good learning activity is, and a check for understanding is to come up with your own definitions of health, health education, and health promotion. Uh, you can look at the, the textbook and get some ideas, but uh, uh, I think it's always a good idea to, to put things into your own words, and that helps with learning. All right, so uh, what is health? Um, there's a pretty common, common definition of health here as a combination of physical, mental, social, emotional, and spiritual factors. You know, those are commonly known as the five dimensions of health. Uh, I think I've even seen a couple of other dimensions added, like occupational and intellectual. But, you know, these are the common ones, physical, mental, social, emotional, and spiritual. So uh, we're looking for a balance among those factors that enable an individual to live to his or her optimal capabilities. And then uh, health education, you know, health education is the things that we do that uh, enable an individual to make good choices. Um, and so if we look at uh, a definition here, the continuum of learning that enables people, individuals, and as members of social structures, because we don't just exist in isolation, uh, to voluntarily make decisions, modify behavior, and change social conditions in ways that are health enhancing. So again, thinking in terms of um, we want to do things to make um, make the healthy choice the easy choice. That's kind of the motto of Live Healthy Baldwin, which is the childhood obesity prevention pro program that I've been managing for the last uh, six or seven years. But you know that's what we try to do is make the healthy choice the easy choice.
All right, so another uh, definition of health education, uh, and I've highlighted some words here that um, I think are important in the definition, but it's a combination of learning experiences, so no one thing is going to do the trick. So we want to use a variety of different uh, learning activities, and they're designed so it's not haphazard, it's not uh, you know something that we do off the cuff, it's something that we do intentionally, uh, give it a lot of thought, and then what we're trying to do is facilitate individuals making voluntary choices that are uh, conducive to their health. And then health promotion. Health promotion is a, a, a broader term than health education. Health education is part of health promotion. But when we talk about health promotion, we're talking more about the uh, kind of the macro level, more about the, um, the environment. Uh, you'll hear me talk about PSE, Policy Systems and Environmental Change. So those are things that we deal with in health promotion. And, you know, it's important for the environment to be conducive for an individual to be able to make a behavior change. So, you know, health promotion is, again, that combination of health education and related organizational, political, and economic interventions designed to facilitate behavioral and environmental adaptations that will improve or protect health. So the word economic is in there too because with a lot of the chronic diseases that we deal with, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, those are called diseases of the poor. Um, they are different, they differentially affect low income and particularly low income minorities. So, um, you know, there's definitely a relationship between in income and health status, and the wealthier you are, the better your health outcomes are typically. So we need to uh, be concerned with all of these things, these organizational, political, and economic uh, strategies when we do health promotion. <clears throat> Uh, continuing on with health promotion, again, you see the idea of combination, uh, educational is part of it, but also ecological, and ecological, again, refers to the total social system. Um, you know, later on in the semester, you'll hear us talk about um, uh, the social determinants of health. Uh, you can Google that if you like, but uh, you'll find out that the real causes of health problems are much deeper than just surface causes like, you know, not exercising or, uh, you know, not eating the right way. So we need to focus on the, the big picture in order to make meaningful, sustainable changes to uh, the health environment. All right, so last thing that I'll leave you with here in terms of health promotion, uh, again, it's the aggregate, which means the collection of all purposeful or intentional activities that are designed to improve personal and public health through a combination of strategies. Again, no one thing is going to do the trick. Uh, we need to look at a variety of what we call multi-intervention strategies uh, and then intervene at multiple levels to, to have the biggest impact. So we're trying to implement behavior change strategies, health education, health protection measures. Uh, you know, if you wore your, your safety belt when you drove to school today, you know, that is a health protection measure. There's a law that was put in place to uh, encourage you to do that. So, uh, you know, that's a part of health promotion. Risk factor detection, health screenings, mammograms, self-exams, things like that are designed to... Uh, detect whether or not you're at risk, um, uh, or whether you have a condition, and then uh, health enhancement and health maintenance. All right, so uh, we've talked about uh, health education and health promotion. Now what about uh, health educators? So you are being prepared to be health educators. Uh, when you finish with your program, you would be er, eligible to sit for the, the CHES exam, which you may have heard of. Uh, CHES stands for Certified Health Education Specialist. There's also the MCHES, which is uh, Master's Certified Health Education Specialist after you've gone through a graduate program. But uh, basically, you're qualified as a health educator if you go through a, an accredited institution, an approved program, 
uh, curriculum that has all of the uh, knowledge and uh, competency areas in it, and that's taught by uh, qualified faculty members. So, um, <clears throat> you know, this comes from the Joint Commission on Terminology as part of something that was called the Role Delineation Project back in the you know, 1990s and uh, early 2000s, which defined uh, the preparation for health educators. So a professionally prepared individual who serves a variety of roles, and we'll look at those roles in, a, in um, uh, a little bit, specifically trained to use appropriate educational strategies and methods to facilitate the development of policies, procedures, interventions, and systems conducive to the health of individuals, groups, and communities. All right, so uh, health education is delivered in various settings. Uh, so I want to pause for a second and ask you to kind of reflect on where you think health education gets delivered. Uh, you know, what are some health education settings? All right, so you may have thought of some of these already. Uh, you know, if you're working with uh, individuals, uh, young individuals, you know, you probably are focusing on the schools. So the schools are a health education setting for K through 12, um, you know, for colleges and universities. We have a health educator here on campus, uh, Rachel Pope, and she's over in uh, student health. But she does health education in a variety of different uh, places at the universities, fraternities, sororities, coming to classes, and so on and so forth. Uh, health education also takes place in governmental and non-governmental agencies. Uh, so, you know, DFACS, for example, uh, the Baldwin County Health Department, those places where health education could happen. Uh, if you're working with adults, uh, you know, most adults during the day are at work, and so work sites can be a health education setting. And then, of course, you have various health care settings like doctor's offices, clinics, hospitals, and so on. <clears throat> Okay, so again, the role delineation project that I mentioned earlier identified um, some areas of responsibility and competency for health educators, um, and these are extremely relevant to what we're going to be doing this semester in health promotion program planning. Um, there's a lot of detail behind these Roman numeral items, but we won't go into those, but we'll just look at the basic uh, uh, categories here. So number one is being able to assess individual and community needs for health education. So you have to identify what the problem is and what the causes of the problem are before you can actually do something about it. And number two is plan health education strategies, interventions, and programs to meet those needs that you identified in, in number one. And then implementing those strategies, interventions, and programs. That's a logical next step. And then conducting evaluation and research related to health education and health promotion. So we want to determine, you know, whether or not our strategies have been effective and, uh, you know, where we go from there. And then number five is administering health education strategies, interventions, and programs. Uh, six, serving as a resource person for individuals and communities. And then finally, uh, communicating and advocating for health and health education. So all of these are part of what a health educator uh, should be able to do once they uh, finish uh, an academic program at a, an institution of higher learning. Okay, so I want to stop here and uh, tell you a little story, um, ask you to, to use your imagination um, and imagine that you're uh, walking along the banks of a river uh, with, with two of your friends. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, you know, we have a river that goes past our community, the Oconee River. You know, maybe you've been down to the Greenway, but uh, I'm sure you can use your imagination and, and just visualize yourself walking along the banks of the river. All right, as you walk along the river, you start to hear in the distance a, a growing roar. That roar is um, the sound of, of water going over a waterfall. And it's not just a little waterfall. We're talking about a big Niagara Falls type waterfall where if you were to go over the waterfall, um, you know, certainly it would be, uh, you know, very hazardous to your health and probably even would result in death. And so as you walk along the river, uh, you look out into the river and you see people uh, floating down the river. 
Um, you know, some are a long way from the falls, some are getting closer to the falls, some are in immediate danger of going over the falls. And so uh, you and your friends decide that something needs to be done. And so one of your friends says, we need to go down further towards the falls, and we need to get the people that are in imminent danger of going over the falls. And another person says, well, uh, you know, I don't think that's uh, going to be very productive because those people are probably goners anyway. We need to focus on the folks that are here in front of us that are, are not there yet, but uh, are in danger of getting to that point. And the other person doesn't say anything, but they just kind of turn on their heels and start going back upstream. And the two friends that are with this person are, you know, kind of dismayed and they say, where are you going? Where are you going? And the person says, well, I'm going to go find out uh, how these people are falling in the river and I'm going to stop that from happening. So let that sink in for a second. You know, it uh, uh, it's kind of illustrative of are different levels of prevention that we go through in, in health education and health promotion, the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary levels. And so let's uh, take a look at Okay, so primary prevention is we're try when we're trying to keep illness or injury from happening at all in the first place. So the person that was going back upstream, uh, you know, they were going to figure out why the problem was happening, and they were going to solve the problem upstream. Secondary prevention, that's kind of equivalent to people have already fallen in the water, they're already in danger, uh, they're drifting towards the falls, but we're not there yet. We're going to see what we can do about uh, keeping it from getting any worse. And then finally, the tertiary prevention, where we have to do drastic measures after something has happened uh, to prevent an individual from experiencing severe um, illness, disability, or even death. So here's a chart that um, you know kind of shows these things, a healthy individual without signs and symptoms of disease, uh, followed by a person who does have uh, signs of, of illness, uh, disease, or injury. And then that, if left unchecked, is going to result in um, uh, problems, severe problems, disability, impairment, uh, and dependency. And then finally, uh, again, if left unchecked, it's ultimately going to result in death. So what we want to do is we want to intervene between these stages. And so primary prevention would be keeping an individual healthy, doing the measures that takes to, uh, to keep illness or injury from happening. And in the event that, you know, we start to see signs and symptoms of illness and disease, as we all seem to, to get as we older, then we need to uh, engage in secondary prevention, and that could be medications, it could be changes in diet, things like that, to uh, try to keep things from getting worse. And then finally, if something uh, does happen, then we go to our, our medical professionals, our doctors, and so on, uh, to do more drastic measures to keep things from getting to the, to the end point. All right, so uh, here's, a, here's a place to check your understanding of the concepts of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Uh, here's a list of, of things uh, from, you know, exercise to open heart surgery to mammograms and so on. Uh, see if you can correctly classify each of these as primary, secondary, or tertiary. Some are obvious, some are, you know, kind of gray areas. I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer for some of these, uh, depending on how you're um, how you're using it and where you're using it in the stage of disease progression, but uh, it's a good way to, to check for understanding to see if you've got it. All right, so in order to uh, engage in health promotion, there are certain things, the certain principles that we need to adhere to or agree to. Um, we call those assumptions of health promotion. So first and foremost, you have to believe that health status can be changed. Um, you know, I think if we don't believe that we can change individuals' health status, then, you know, we're really uh, you're in the wrong business. We're, we're probably wasting our time. Uh, another thing that we need to assume is that, you know, health and disease are determined by uh, complicated processes, dynamic interactions among biological, 
uh, psychological, behavioral, and social factors. The more we know, the more we uh, understand that, you know, health status is a complex thing and it's determined by a lot of different factors. Um, third thing is we need to assume uh, or hold to the belief that disease occurrence theories and principles can be understood. Um, you know, we know a lot more today than we knew 50 years ago, and 50 years from now, we're going to know a lot more than we do today. But the idea is that we do uh, understand, you know, at least where we are today, that there are theories, uh, there are principles about how people get diseases. Uh, we understand causes, we understand those factors, and we can go from there. Uh, number four is that appropriate prevention strategies can develop to deal with those health problems. And if you don't believe that, then uh, there's no sense going forward. But we do have what we call best practices um, that uh, have been developed to deal with strategies, and we need to uh, adhere to those best practices and continue to develop new strategies. Number five, we need to believe that behavior can be changed and that those changes can influence health. Um, you know, anybody who's tried to change a behavior uh, knows that it's not easy, um, that it takes time, but anybody that has changed a behavior knows that it can be done. So, um, you know, like I say, it's not easy, but we do uh, continue to believe that we can influence people to make uh, good choices and to change their behavior. Uh, number six is that it's it's complicated and that there are a lot of different factors that come to bear on it. So our individual behavior, our family interactions, the community that we live in, workplace, our relationships, resources, and public policy all contribute to uh, health and influence behavior change. So again, we, we adopt that assumption, and so our strategies need to be directed at those multiple, uh, multiple levels. Multi-intervention strategies at multiple levels are going to be more effective than you know, individual single strategies directed at you know, a single level. Hope that makes sense. You know, we had the uh, the pleasure of having two daughters get married within nine months of each other, and so we had a lot of planning uh, that took place months and months in advance of an event that lasted probably a few hours. Uh, the ceremony itself, you know, maybe 40, 45 minutes tops, and then the reception a couple of hours, three hours, whatever, after that. And so... You know, contrast the months of planning uh, for the fairly short activity itself, um, and you can see what all needs to go into it. And sometimes we hire professionals. Sometimes you hire a wedding planner. You use planning tools to help make sure that you don't forget anything, uh, that you've covered all your bases. Again, all so that um, the actual program itself goes off well, it goes off without a hitch. Okay, so some more terminology just to sort of wrap that up in the uh, in this chapter in this lesson. Uh, we have the idea of stakeholders, decision makers, pre-planning, and the priority population. So your stakeholders are all of the individuals, all of the organizations, all of the agencies that have a vested interest in the things that you're trying to do. Uh, so this week, uh, you'll either have already been to the Harrisburg community or you'll be going to the Harrisburg community. Every Tuesday, you know, 30 to 40 people gather around those tables, and they've been doing that for several years now because they all care about the community and the things that are happening out there, and they want to have a voice. They're stakeholders. They're either individuals that live in the community or have lived in the community, uh, the representatives of organizations or agencies like the Milledgeville Community Garden Association, uh, Central Georgia Technical College, various churches that are in the community, uh, Georgia College representatives are there, uh, Baldwin County Family Connection, Habitat for Humanity. All of those folks are what we would call stakeholders. And then you have decision makers. You have people that are in positions of power that control access to resources and control um, you know, the types of policies that we put in place. 
Again, you will uh, be meeting or will have met uh, Commissioner Tommy French, who's a Baldwin County Commissioner. Uh, he represents the Harrisburg community. Uh, and uh, uh, Harold Simmons, who's a measure, member of the Board of Education. He's also a longtime resident of the Harrisburg community and has a business that's based out of there. So those are folks that you have to get on your side because they're the ones that um, will allow you to do or advocate for the kinds of things that you want to do. You've got to get those people on your side. Uh, Pre-planning means the things that we do prior to, uh, to planning and getting involved, and that usually includes you know, developing relationships, developing trust, gaining um, access to a community uh, so that you know, our, our efforts can be well received. And then the priority population. In older literature, you might ref see it referred to as the target population. Uh, priority population is the group of individuals that you want to be working with. Um, in our circumstances, you know, the priority population are usually people that, for one reason or another, are not uh, capable of helping themselves, don't have the resources to help themselves, don't feel empowered to be able to help themselves. And so that's what we try to do is we try to work with the underserved prop population, typically um, disadvantaged in some way, uh, economically, educationally. And uh, so, you know, what we try to do is, is help those individuals um, move their communities forward to benefit their health. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the last thing that we'll talk about here uh, in this chapter, uh, and it kind of bleeds over into uh, lesson number two about planning models, is something called the generalized model for program planning. And it outlines the steps that we need to go through in order to implement, in order to plan for health promotion. And so uh, step number one, assessing the needs of the priority population. Uh, and then once you've identified and prioritized those needs, then you establish your goals and objectives for what you want to accomplish. Uh, you select or develop the interventions that are going to allow you to, uh, you know, to meet those goals and objectives, and then finally implement those interventions and evaluate the results, uh, determine what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, and then typically the cycle starts all over again um, as we uh, identify new needs or, you know, try to meet needs that we didn't meet uh, the first time around. And then the, uh, at the bottom there, I asked about, well, what about understanding engaging the priority population? Should that be a step? Where does it fit? Uh, in some books that describe the generalized planning model, they'll have a, a preliminary step that says understanding and engaging the priority population. I already talked about that in terms of what's, what we call pre-planning, and I think it is a very important and necessary step because... Uh, unless you're accepted, unless you develop relationships, unless you build trust, um, you know, you're not going to do a very good job of, of, uh, of health promotion in a community where you're not accepted. Okay, so uh, finally, I encourage you to go back and take a look at the learning objectives for this lesson. Uh, you know, actually try to do some of these things and determine whether or not you feel like you uh, understand the material. Uh, go back and, and do the reading or reread. Um, feel free to uh, ask me any questions that you might have about the material, and uh, and we'll um, end it here today and, uh, and look for lesson number two next week. Thanks a lot.